Hello, everybody. So with our topic this week, we've got the Central Valley Bioregion or really, you know, our home uh, here in Bakersfield. Uh, I tried to uh, pick an image of the Central Valley, which um, really, I think, uh, is is an image that's really what most people think of in terms of the Central Valley, the big, wide expanse, the the rolling foothills in the background, the just just endless um, endless string of vegetation. I think is is what the majority of people kind of um, think about when they when they think about the Central Valley. When we get to the ecological zones, we'll talk about the different um, parts of it and and um, whether the Central Valley looks the way. Uh, it always did historically, but I think um, this sort of an image is, is what people really think of when they think of the Central Valley. So, uh, in terms of just the description of the Central Valley, we have our Central Valley bioregion right here. It's um, it's a massive valley of um, really two valleys. Of, you got the Sacramento uh, Valley up north, and then you've got the San Joaquin Valley in the south, um, but you've got a 500 mile long and 75 mile wide area of, of the state, which is about 15% of the whole state of California. And it is just, um, it's just a massive, massive uh, area of vegetation. Uh, it used to be all sorts of different types of vegetation, but now with uh, um, with the, the, the fertility uh, available in this land, uh, the majority of it's been converted to agriculture. About 82% of the total area has been converted to agriculture. And that's just, it's actually part of a long history of uh, alteration and land conversion to where the Central Valley, it just, as soon as people saw it, it was all about, um, well, you know, let's settle here and let's grow things here. And it, it's just, that conversion to agriculture because things grow so well here and it's easy to grow things and you've got very fertile soils this um, this place just made sense to to grow to grow things and it's just become more and more uh, into that that agricultural conversion so what did it look like before so there were prairies oak savannas semi-arid grasslands freshwater marshes and um, big, large uh, wetland areas with riparian woodlands. Um, in fact, uh, at one point in time, there was the largest uh, wetland in the in California in the Central Valley. But uh, all, pretty much, all of that has changed. There are little uh, bits and pieces here and there, but a lot of that has changed uh, throughout the years. So in terms of physical geography and kind of just kind of going more on this description, um, what else uh, can we talk about in terms of the Central Valley? Uh, we've mentioned, mentioned it before. It's two valleys uh, lying end to end, the Sacramento and the San Joaquin. Uh, so where they actually meet is where the rivers um, actually meet. So both so we call it the Sacramento uh, Valley because of the Sacramento River, and we call it the San Joaquin Valley because of the San Joaquin River. And um, those two rivers meet uh, at the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta, which then goes into um, into the bay, um, starts off in the in the East Bay around uh, Antioch and um, Pittsburgh area, and just works its way out to the San Francisco Bay. And so we've got Northern California and Southern California, or what we um, probably all more think of as Central California, all of that area coming together uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, you, most of this area is at sea level. Uh, at, towards the ends, the Northern and Southern end, you could get up to around 400 feet, but most, most of it's at sea level. And um, you get a blending between um, valley and foothill vegetation type, uh, vegetation type. So um, when we're talking about the Central Valley, it's hard to totally distinguish it as just the um, the bottom the bottom portion as to where uh, 
um, the savannas transition to the woodlands, transition to the the mountains. So the surrounding foothills area um, is encompassed in the Central Valley as well um, because of uh, a lot of change in terms of land conversion. There's a uh, strong lack of flooding that used to exist uh, in this area with the the large lakes uh, that used to exist, the much larger floodplains and larger rivers um, that used to exist. Um, now all that water is controlled, all dammed off and all um, all restricted. And that's really uh, led to a lot of change uh, within the uh, within the valley in terms of vegetation types and amounts of vegetation and uh, structure of vegetation. Uh, Geology-wise, it can be summed up as a large trough of mud, um, 30,000 feet of sedimentary soils to be specific. And it's the idea that um, that because we're it's it's this bowl effect where we've got two large mountain ranges on both sides with um, everything just kind of funneling down to the valley, that this area is just covered in sedimentary soils with alluvial sediment, mostly coming from the Sierras because it's coming with the coming down with the water, but it's just coming down and just bringing a lot of sediment with it, and that sediment has just just settled in the valley and stacked layers of sediment um, that we um, look at as our just our basic soils now. But then. Um, what's nice about that is that is why this area is so fer fertile. Is these, sed these sedimentary soils really, um, really good soils, really easy to to till and to to move. So, it's it's kind of what has uh, driven the uh, the uh, want for agriculture in this area. So, in terms of fire or looking at our fire climate variables. Temperature and rainfall patterns here promote herbaceous vegetation, not really woody vegetation as much. And what woody vegetation you get is scattered, so mostly woodlands uh, rather than forests for the most part. The only places you really get forests in the Central Valley are along riparian corridors because you have that, um, that uh, water component just right there when you need it. Uh, you, in terms of rainfall, you get moderate rainfall in the north, but you, in the south you get more desert-like conditions. Down in our area, you're only talking six to eight inches of rain per year on average, where it's more uh, in the 20s, 30s, uh, up in the north. You also, because of that same bowl effect that I was talking about with the mountain ranges on both sides, you're, you get a lack of the offshore uh, winds and offshore flow and also you don't really have that um, same worry that Southern California has of the fern winds due to those mountain ranges kind of blocking us off so we get blocked off on both sides now that also um, creates certain effects like the uh, like the Thule fog because we're such a, a low-lying area and also when we get to uh, management issues uh, we'll uh, it exacerbates the air quality uh, problems that we have in this area. Uh, also, uh, in terms of, you know, well, what what do we need to start fire? We need ignitions, so there are plenty of people in this area, um, but we, we control those ignitions um, quite frequently. And um, then the other usual cause of ignitions is lightning strikes, but we get a, lo a very low density of lightning strikes in this area. Well, why is that? Well, the, the, we're the low part, right? We're down at sea level, and it's different from the Sierras to where you've got, you know, much more topography, you're higher up, much more likely to catch something, whereas um, just down here in the valley, it's just you get a very low density of lightning strikes comparatively. Slide myself over here. All right, so in terms of fire occurrence and really trying to understand um, the fire regime and the pattern of fire in this area, it's it's pretty hard um, for the most part because we've had um, such a huge amount of land conversion and alteration. And then also because of what exists um, as the dominant vegetation in this area, you don't have a lot of trees to begin with and you don't have a lot of trees 
um, right next to each other in the same areas and top that all off they're most for the most part we don't have long-lived trees so it's really hard to estimate the fire record before European settlement um, what we what we can estimate just based on what we've seen uh, in other places and what we've seen in the studies mentioned in the book is that um, with such a high density of Native Americans in the valley um, it just seems like it supports the idea of frequent burning of grasslands and savanna vegetation plus um, just the the pattern of vegetations that we're seeing and um, the way the idea of what we know about the ecology of grasslands and savannas really support the idea of frequent low severity fires plus knowing that that would um, benefit the the populations of Native Americans it just seems that it would make sense that that was the historic fire regime um, some estimates um, maybe put it around uh, one to three years in terms of a fire return interval uh, what's also interesting is there's a very early influence of non-native species uh, in this area which makes it um, which also makes it really difficult to to figure out what's happening in terms of of um, fire history in this area or uh, if even the fire history that we see in some of the records is um, is accurate because accurate to um, what was uh, what happened farther along in the past in this area because it's a different um, species composition uh, currently uh, we because of land use and fragmentation and uh, the idea of um, huge populations uh, in the Central Valley uh, there's not really uh, not really a, a, a current fire history uh, to really speak of most fires are contained to around 10 acres or less uh, the largest fire in the Central Valley in the last 50 years has only been about 15,000 acres which you know you compare that to uh, some of the mega fires that we've been having lately in the other areas in the other bioregions and it's not really it's not even close in terms of of size or um, or severity and so um, with with the suppression uh, efforts in this area just not really um, the, we do get fires but it's really small stuff and really contained very quickly so let's talk about then the different ecological zones of the Central Valley and maybe some that we're that we're definitely thinking about and some that we're just maybe we just don't know because we haven't seen uh, those parts or we don't come from those areas so let's start with foothill woodlands which is probably my favorite part of the, the Central Valley um, I would have to say I just uh, the rolling oak woodlands I just it's I I really like it I enjoy it uh, I grew up in the Bay Area um, so just the idea of the foothills on the outskirts of town is just what I'm used to you know driving up and down through the Bay Area and um, just the idea of the rolling oak woodlands um, I I've spent a lot of time in Sacramento and that's what I think of and I just I really like um, I like the look of the you know the savanna uh, aspect that comes with with foothill woodlands um, the foothill woodlands really frame the Central Valley so we talked about that that bowl effect so um, we're upslope um, from the from the valley floor but still not really into the next uh, uh, bioregion um, but probably you know we get a little mixture of that because uh, when we're talking about the Sierra Nevadas uh, we also talk about uh, oak woodlands and so it's you know it's it's in some areas it blends in some areas it's different uh, it just kind of depends because uh, we got you know such variation uh, in this state in terms of just all sorts of species diversity uh, major species uh, we've talked about it uh, before in the in the Sierra Nevada but but blue oak for the most part foothill pine and then um, down south here we see valley oak which um, we have some on campus uh, if you ever get a chance to see 
and there's um, there's a few valley oaks here and there around town if you if you look uh, hard enough. Um, the blue oak savannas usually you'll see those on southern aspects and areas with shallow soils. Um, these this area, just like the other areas, has definitely been altered by non-native plants. Usually in the um, herbaceous layer is where we'll see the the majority of the non-native plants. the The overstory is still really um, mostly those major uh, tree species. In terms of fire, uh, oaks aren't really fire enhanced. Uh, in terms of um, at the at the the sprout level, um, oaks do re-sprout, and fire can um, can uh, enhance sprouting. But um, in terms of once they're a little bit older, in terms of like a seedling. Uh, stage a little young tiny tree um, there they'd be fire inhibited so fire will kill um, a lot of the the smaller oak trees so um, if you want to if you're trying to um, use fire uh, to stimulate uh, the oaks you either need to get them uh, you need to put fire on the ground when they're in that sprouting stage because that'll that'll help create more sprouts and help enhance um, the, the oak regeneration, but if we're, uh, if we got a lot, a lot of little small trees going, those trees need to be at least five to seven feet tall and greater than an inch and a half in diameter to, uh, avoid top kill. Because if they are smaller than that, the fire will wipe them out. Uh, if you, if you have, uh, an overstory like we see in this picture behind here, You'll probably get a uh, little mortality in the overstory unless you have a high intensity fire burning through the area. Uh, here's just another picture of that idea of um, the rolling uh, oak woodlands. And just, you know, this reminds me um, personally because uh, I spend a lot of time in Fresno too. Is uh, you know, driving up to Yosemite and uh, heading up Highway 41. But I think what ma the majority of people really think about when they think about the Central Valley is they think about the valley grasslands. But the valley grasslands, for the most part, um, don't look anything like what they would have been historically. So um, by the mid-1800s, the, this area was already covered up um, by non-natives and um, nowadays it can be up to 90 percent of the areas in most uh, in most parts of the Central Valley have non-native vegetation and um, it's just continuing waves of of invasion of species because you know we have so much traffic going through uh, the Central Valley in terms of people in terms of businesses in terms of uh, agriculture with, you know, um, taking, bringing seeds in and taking plants out that, uh, that the grasslands really uh, are probably much different uh, today than they, than they were um, in the past. And it's not, it's not even really a maybe it's, they are, we don't, we don't see the, the valley the way that it, that it was historically really at all because all we really see for the most part now are are the agricultural areas that were probably either riparian vegetation uh, wetland habitat or um, grasslands for the most part um, what what we do know about the valley grasslands that we do have is you've got a diverse assemblage of perennial gra grasses uh, in the north so in the sacramento valley and in the central and southern, so the so the San Joaquin part of the valley, um, you mostly got uh, annual vegetation. So if we need just that um, quick refresher, perennial, we're talking about hold seeds for more than one year. Annual vegetation, it goes through a whole life cycle in one year. So in the north, you've got more perennial grasses, perennial bunch grasses um, that that live for a few years, um, whereas down here in the south, more than likely um, forbs rather than grasses, so annual um, herbaceous forbs on upland sites. You got the wetland vegetation, the lowland sites, and then also um, uh, 
probably depending on um, moisture and soil type, you could have ended up with some sort of uh, like alkali desert scrub um, as well down in the south, especially in the areas where you're lacking um, precipitation, so you're lacking that av available moisture. In terms of the perennial grasses, because those are the ones that have really been studied in terms of uh, fire effects, they, uh, they respond well to fire. Um, the non-native species in the valley grasslands um, actually are not well adapted to fire. So, um, so it's really, it really helps paint that picture of how long um, these grasslands have been um, covered up by the non-native species uh, because they, we know that they're not well adapted to fire. So if there were these frequent um, low intensity, frequent fire uh frequent fires in the past that we that we um, assume there to be in this area, we would see a lot a uh, lot more um, areas of diversity in my mind or see see a lot more of these um, what we what we predict would be there in the valley grasslands as opposed to what we actually uh, see there now. Uh, if if water is limited, fire can have a negative effect on those perennial grass species. Um, just because I think, you know, with, with a lack of water, you're going to have, it's hard for any of these species to grow because water can be so limiting, uh, in these areas. And we could, we especially see that down here in the, um, uh, in the, the south part of the valley where, you know, we got many days without rain. Um, in terms of fire and grazing, because grazing is obviously important, um, in, in these grasslands, as well, even uh, agriculturally speaking, um, lots of grazing happening. Uh, you got no no significant impacts when fire and grazing were um, studied together in terms of uh, perennial grass response. And so, uh, there's still uh, still not a lot uh, known um, about what these grasslands look like um, when you get to kind of the prehistorical record and it would be interesting um, to really start introducing fire into these grassland areas and kind of start seeing what what comes up and and um, you know if we could continue to to really um, get these areas to where we could possibly say maybe this you know if we can get rid of these non-native species you know, this is what it could look like, and it, it'd just be interesting to, to do a comparison. Riparian forest is our third um, ecological zone, and uh, this picture right here is from the Panorama Vista Preserve, right down the bluffs from our home at Bakersfield College. So those are the bluffs in the background. This is the Kern River that you see, and this is the Panorama Vista Preserve. It's a riparian forest uh, alongside of the Kern River. So um, all of the large rivers of, of the valley supported an extensive riparian forest habitat. Uh, the Kern River was obviously much bigger than it used to be, um, and all of these rivers were much bigger than they used to be if you take away all of the um, all of the dams and all of the flood control um, that we do and all of the um, water diversion um, for agriculture and for um, water supply that we have happening um, now due to our um, land conversion to agriculture as well as our um, large population. Uh, it was estimated that riparian forest habitat uh, in the mid 19th century covered about a million acres in the Central Valley and if you think about what the Central Valley looks like now um, versus then, um, you when you think of riparian forests, so just forests along the river corridors, you don't, you just, you you almost have a hard time wrapping your head around the idea of a million acres of that existing uh, in the mid 19th century. But there was quite a bit of this habitat um, before the before the land conversion. Your major species are black willow, Fremont cottonwood, western sycamore, valley oak, and box elder, or what I would tell you is somebody who's um, lived in different parts of the uh, of the United States. Uh, very typical 
uh, in terms of your species. Willow and cottonwood, you just, if you have riparian habitat, you, you have willow and cottonwood. You know, if you're east of the Mississippi, it just becomes eastern cottonwood instead of Fremont cottonwood. But black willow is a, is a species you, you always find in these riparian areas. And then western sycamore is, uh, is quite a dominant species down at the Panorama Vista Preserve. And they're trying to um, restore some box elder um, down there as well. The, 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 the Vista Preserve's um, goals right now are riparian forest uh, habitat restoration. So it's an area that we, uh, we uh, in this program are very supportive of and will spend a lot of time uh, down at. Uh, riparian forests aren't fire dependent. They do, uh, these species are, are sprouting species, but um, even a moderate severity event could result in complete overstory mortality. They are not, uh, these species don't work well with fire. Um, and uh, if uh, these areas have shorter fire return intervals, could lead to invasions of, of woody species because the, um, the, the overstory species wouldn't um, be able to uh, take over in time and uh, be able to outcompete that that weedy vegetation. Um, if this these species though um, will burn readily uh, during periods of drought, so if you get drought um, drought uh, periods, then these areas could be susceptible to fire. So it's something to just uh, just keep an eye on, especially um, not only with the idea of drought, but we also do so much um, so much flood control and so much water control that we can almost create drought-like uh, conditions as well by um, not allowing so much water through. Just look at uh, look at the Kern River down on the the southwest part of town where you don't really even see any water in the in the channel and just look at that um, riparian forest versus um, you know if you go out of the valley and up um, into the the mountains and look at the uh, the riparian corridor that we have along the Kern River it's much different and that just ties into this last um, last piece of uh, information here the idea of lack of flooding um, can lead to fuel accumulation and it can, and I just think Overall, the lack of flooding, the lack of um, water has has changed um, what we what we see in the Central Valley in terms of um, species and species diversity, especially in these riparian areas that were much much larger and covered a, a much bigger swath of the Central Valley. It's it's I think it's been um, hugely de detrimental, but. I understand it. I understand the, the need for food and the um, great uh, agricultural prowess of the Central Valley. But um, as, as an ecologist, it'd be really nice to, uh, to still have these large riparian corridors uh, throughout the Central Valley. And our last uh, major ecological zone is freshwater marsh. This picture right here is from the Pixley National Wildlife Refuge uh, up in uh, Tulare County. Um, so just uh, about an hour, give or take, right about an hour away from, um, from school here at BC. So the Tulare, Buena Vista, and Kern Lakes um, all used to form the largest wetland in California and it had about 2,100 miles of shoreline before all of the dewatering and the flood control and all the other things that we uh, do with our water nowadays. March, marsh, marsh, marsh vegetation uh, is arranged um, based on water depth and then um, wetland ecological requirements and what we kind of consider uh, the requirements of a wetland. If you don't remember that, um, go back through uh, your natural resources notes um, when we talk about uh, wetlands. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the vegetation near shore, you get reed-like plants, cattails, bulrushes, sedges. You also um, will get uh, an overstory of willows, so really black willows, red willows, and Pacific willows. And then in terms of fire, um, not really, not really much known, not really much of a history because this, 
these areas um, could, you know, if you get um, good rain events or, or just good um, um, good precipitation years, these these areas will hold water um, throughout the summer and, and could hold water all year. Um, so uh, in terms of that, it's also worth noting in terms of fire that they could, they and the, the riparian um, forest areas can form effective barriers to fire spread. Um, and thinking about uh, the that past fire history of frequent low severity fire, uh, having these areas uh, throughout the valley maybe helped in terms of uh, being able to have a barrier, a nice natural barrier that you can run the fire into to, to you know help with control efforts. Um, but freshwater uh, marshes, those reed-like species really do burn um, with really great intensity if you get the the right conditions. And I have, uh, when I was in Georgia, we did a lot of prescribed burning and we did um, burn some of these um, freshwater uh, areas um, when when we could. Uh, and um, it does, that vegetation can burn really well. I don't um, actually remember um, being able to see um, the response to fire because I think I um, left for California before then, but uh, certainly the vegetation does burn um, with great intensity when it is when it is dry and when it can burn. And that takes us to our management issues for um, for the Central Valley, and they really it's two two major issues. Um, and it's just the first one just becomes this idea of alteration and land conversion and so that has led to this boom and um, the great presence of agriculture which um, i think is uh, as an ecologist is both uh, both a gift and a curse in that um, agriculture does really well here and it is you know it is the um, you know, the, it provides the food for the majority of the nation, um, as well as, as well as other nations. Um, but it's led to non-native, a lot of non-native species introduction. And it's led to really this, uh, this question of restoration. So I put this picture here of what the, um, this is what the wetlands used to look like. And now what our wetlands look like in the Central Valley. And when you look at that and you see what it used to be versus what it is now, um, it's really important um, to just kind of think of of this question of restoration and can we actually restore this area to what it was? And does that even make sense anymore with what we have going on in the Central Valley? And is it is it even possible? Because I mean, we had so much wetland habitat, we had so much riparian forest, we had so much more freshwater marsh, and I don't know that we can ever actually go back to that. And then with the fragmentation and with what we have left, if we expand these areas or we try and connect some of these areas, can, can we do that? Um, is it possible or is it not even um, a possibility? Those are, those are really kind of that's the big management issue is how do we deal with this alteration with this land conversion? Do we really try to get back to what it was before or do we really have to kind of plan for some sort of a different future where, um, where we might just have to accept some of the things for the way they are and, and just kind of move forward. Our second um, big management issue is air quality, which I think after the fires, the majority of us are are very aware of um, with that that bowl effect with the the two mountains and then the the big valley how everything just comes and sits down in here so um, you do get uh, you do get um, some pr prescribed burning for agriculture you also get prescribed burning trying to be done by um, by fire personnel uh, in the area and all of that then limits the amount of burn permits. And then on top of that, um, if we get these conditions, because humidity can get really low um, in during the warm season here. So you got a lot of days that are, um, that are kind of fire prohibited because of, you know, we get our hot, hot temperatures. 
especially down here in the in the southern valley you get hot temperatures you, you have a lot of days since the last rain and then you've got low low relative humidity which are all good signs that um, you can have fire that could possibly get out of control or be hard to manage and so it's hard to um, it's hard to then um, be able to get fire on the ground when you need to get fire on the ground and then uh, top that off with these huge mega fires burning in all these different areas because if we think about this area as the the central valley you know we had fires in the sierras we had fires up north around ukiah we had fires in the north of the bay area and all of that just comes and just sits all of that smoke just gets blown into the central valley and and just sits in the central valley and could be you know months that we've seen where we get that that awful air quality uh, not to mention then when we have something like the creek fire burning right in our backyard um, how much smoke that that sends um, our way as well so those are the the two biggest management issues um, with the with the central valley and um, i think there's a lot of people trying to work on what is the right answer uh, but it's a very those are very complex uh, issues that involve a lot of stakeholders and uh, it's gonna it's gonna take a lot of people coming to the table and and um, you know trying to be uh, trying to work together and, and really fighting for the for the bigger goal and that is what I have in terms of uh, the Central Valley uh, I just I thought this was a nice picture um, just really showing kind of all of the uh, the good parts of the Central Valley you know I started off with that picture of really just the the vast uh, the vastness of the valley with you know like I-5 and that's what most people think about the Central Valley but I think this is what more most people more people should know about the Central Valley and think and want to have more of these areas in the Central Valley where you get um, you get the uh, the uh, um, differences in vegetations the grasslands and the uplands and the lowlands and you have a, a water component and it's it's all the best parts of the of the Central Valley in the in the background the top right of that image you can see a little little woodland um, off there as well as the top left um, some of the the woodland areas and it's just uh, the valley can offer a lot of diversity it's our home it's a it's actually a great place to live um, and it's just you know what what do we want the valley to look like because I think we can use fire and other tools and really uh, shape the valley in a different way but it's going to take a lot of people um, who want to to want to see the valley uh, in a different way but that's what I got I uh, hope you enjoyed it and uh, off to the central coast uh, next week <music>